Welcome to Review Central. This is OopCat Reviewer number 1, featuring questions for the OopCat Science Proficiency Subtest. This reviewer is intended for those who are eyeing, or are set to take, the University of the Philippines College Admission Test, or OopCat. There are 10 questions featured on this reviewer. All questions are modeled on actual questions that appeared on previous OopCats. Before we proceed, don't forget to subscribe to Review Central and click or press the bell button to make sure you get notified whenever we post a new reviewer or other review materials on this channel. Let's begin. Question number one. How many moles of CO2 does 88 grams of carbon dioxide contain? A, two. B, three. C, four. D, five. The correct answer is A, 88 grams of carbon dioxide contains 2 moles. This is, of course, a typical chemistry problem. For the solution, one way to obtain the number of moles is by dividing the mass, in grams, with the molar mass of an element or molecule. Given the mass of carbon dioxide to be 88 grams, first, let's compute for the molar mass of carbon dioxide. Molar mass is equal to the atomic mass of carbon plus 2 times the atomic mass of oxygen. We recall from our basic chemistry that that atomic masses of carbon and oxygen are 12 and 16, respectively. Therefore, we should arrive at a molar mass of 44 grams per mole. Now let's compute for the moles of carbon dioxide. Moles is equal to mass over the molar mass. The mass is given to be 88 grams, and we computed for the molar mass to be 44 grams per mole. Therefore, moles of above 88 grams of carbon dioxide is equal to 2. Question number 2. Each of two replicated strands of a chromosome is called A. Aster B. Centriole C. Synapse D. Chromatid The correct answer is D. Chromatid. A chromatid is one of two identical halves of a replicated chromosome. During cell division, the chromosomes first replicate so that each daughter cell receives a complete set of chromosomes. Question number 3. Newton's first law of motion states that, every object remains at rest or in motion in a straight line at constant speed unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. What is the net force acting on an airplane in level flight at 500 km per hour due north? A. 100 newtons B. 490 newtons C. 980 newtons D. 0 The correct answer is D. 0. An aircraft in flight is a particularly good example of the first law of motion. There are four major forces acting on an aircraft, lift, weight, thrust, and drag. If we consider the motion of an aircraft at a constant altitude, we can neglect the lift and weight. A cruising aircraft flies at a constant airspeed and the thrust exactly balances the drag of the aircraft. This is the first part cited in Newton's first law, there is no net force on the airplane and it travels at a constant velocity in a straight line. Question number 4. Suppose two hypothetical organisms with blue eyes have an offspring with red eyes. Assuming that this trait obeys the Mendelian laws of inheritance, which among the following statements is true. A. Red eye color is the dominant trait. B. The red-eyed offspring has a homozygous dominant genotype. C. The red-eyed offspring has a heterozygous genotype. D. The parents both have a heterozygous genotype. The correct answer is D, the parents both have a heterozygous genotype. Since both parents have blue eyes, blue eye color must be the dominant trait. Therefore red eye color cannot be the dominant trait. A is not true. The red-eyed offspring cannot have a homozygous dominant genotype since both parents have blue eye color as their dominant trait. Red eye color must be a recessive trait from either or both parents. The red-eyed offspring must have a homozygous recessive genotype. B is also not true. The red-eyed offspring cannot have a heterozygous genotype since both parents have blue eye color as their dominant trait. 
so C is likewise not true. The parents both have a heterozygous genotype in which blue eye color is the dominant trait and red eye color is a recessive trait. Question number 5. Igneous rocks originate when magma or lava cools and crystallizes or when pyroclastic materials are consolidated. The two categories of igneous rocks are plutonic rocks, which form within the Earth's crust, and volcanic rocks, which form at the surface. Volcanic rocks can usually be distinguished from plutonic rocks by a. the size of its mineral crystals b. its iron-magnesium content c. its composition d. its color The correct answer is a. the size of its mineral crystals. The texture of an igneous rock depends on the size of the crystals in the rock. This tells us if the rock is plutonic or volcanic. When magma cools underground, it cools very slowly and when lava cools above ground, it cools quickly. When magma and lava cool, mineral crystals start to form in the molten rock. Plutonic rocks, which cools slowly underground, have large crystals because the crystals had enough time to grow to a large size. Volcanic rocks, which cool quickly above ground, have small crystals because the crystals did not have enough time to grow very large. Question number 6. An analysis of a compound used in the production of aluminum is 32.79% sodium, 13.02% aluminum and 54.19% fluorine. The empirical formula of the compound is A. Na3, Al, F6 B. Na5, Al, F8 C. Na, Al, F D. Na3, Al, F3 The correct answer is A, Na3, Al, F6. To determine the empirical formula given the percent composition of each element of a compound, follow these steps. Step 1, divide each element's percent value by its atomic mass. We should arrive at the following values. Sodium, 1.43. Aluminum, 0.48. Fluorine, 2.85. Step 2, divide each of the results from step 1 with whichever is smallest. We should get the following values. Sodium, 2.98. Aluminum, 1. Fluorine, 5.94. Step 3, round the results of step 2 to find the lowest whole number ratio. We'll arrive at 3, 1, and 6 for sodium, aluminum, and fluorine, respectively. Therefore, the empirical formula is, Na3, Al, F6. Question number 7. The reason why we see eclipses of the moon more often than solar eclipses, even though solar eclipses happen more frequently is that A. Lunar eclipses are visible over more than half of Earth compared to less than 20% of Earth's surface for partial solar eclipses. B. The weather is more cloudy during the new moon. C. A lunar eclipse lasts longer than a solar eclipse. D. People are not so interested in the solar eclipse. The correct answer is A. Lunar eclipses are more widely visible because Earth casts a much larger shadow on the moon during a lunar eclipse than the moon casts on Earth during a solar eclipse. As a result, you are more likely to see a lunar eclipse than a solar eclipse. Question number 8. Global climate change can be attributed to the increase in what two gases produced by human activities? A. Nitrous oxide and sulfur dioxide. B. Methane and carbon dioxide. C. Ozone and carbon dioxide. D. Ozone and methane. The correct answer is B. Methane and carbon dioxide. The primary greenhouse gases in Earth's atmosphere are water vapor, H2O, carbon dioxide, CO2, methane, CH4, nitrous oxide, N2O, and ozone, O3. Of these, carbon dioxide and methane are produced in huge quantities by human activities. Question number 9. 
A graduated cylinder is used to measure liquid volume. The correct way of reading the level of mercury in a graduated cylinder is A. Read from the top of the meniscus B. Read from the bottom of the meniscus C. Use the lowest point of the mercury in the cylinder D. Take the average of the highest and the lowest points The correct answer is A. Read from the top of the meniscus when measuring liquids using a graduated cylinder, place the graduated cylinder on a flat surface and view the height of the liquid in the cylinder with your eyes directly level with the liquid. The liquid will tend to curve downward. This curve is called the meniscus. The convention is to always read the measurement at the bottom of the meniscus. In the case of mercury however, you need to measure from the top of the mercury column, flat area of the mercury, and ignore the lower level along the perimeter where mercury is repelled by the glass. Question number 10. A flashlight has three identical 1.5 volt batteries in it, arranged in a chain to give a total of 4.5 volts. Current passes first through battery A, then through battery B, then through battery C, on its way to the bulb. When the flashlight is turned on, the batteries provide power to the current and they gradually use up their chemical potential energy. Which battery will run out of chemical potential energy first? A. Battery A will run out first. B. Battery B will run out first. C. Battery C will run out first. D. All three will run out at the same time. The correct answer is D. All three will run out at the same time. All three will run out at the same time, provided that the batteries are identical and also have equal charge, that is, chemical potential energy. This is because the current is equal at all points in a series circuit, so whatever amount of current there is in any one of the series connected batteries must be the same for all the others as well. Also, electrical energy travels as electromagnetic waves at about the speed of light, which is 670,616,629 miles per hour or 300 million meters per second. This means that the time it takes for electricity to travel from battery 1 to battery N, where N can be any number, large or small, in a chain or series circuit is negligible. In other words, it is as if all the batteries are one and the same. You have just completed OOPCAT reviewer number 1, which featured questions for the OOPCAT science proficiency subtest. If you wish to watch more OOPCAT reviewers for the OOPCAT science proficiency subtest, check out our OOPCAT science proficiency reviewers playlist. Check out also our other OOPCAT playlists for other reviewer topics. If you haven't done so yet, please don't forget to subscribe to Review Central and click or press the bell button to make sure you get notified whenever we post a new reviewer or other review materials on this channel. Please like if you find this video useful, and feel free to share it to anyone who may also benefit from it. We wish you all the best on your forthcoming OOPCAP, and we look forward to your exciting days as an ESCO or ISCA. Kadayon!